The Australian economy is unique. 35% of the country is practically desert, and geographically it is isolated. 98% of its trade is exported by sea. Yet it has become one of the richest countries in the world, richer than the UK, France and Germany. From 1991 to 2020, it experienced the longest period of economic growth in the world. Even the global credit crisis didn't hold back the Australian economy. Australia's wealth is largely dependent on natural resources, coal, gas, iron ore and gold. It means that when the global energy crisis hit, Australia was one of the few countries to benefit from a boom in commodity prices. Though as this graph for coal shows, what goes up can also come down. Australia has also benefited from a booming Chinese economy. China's rapid economic growth has caused an insatiable appetite for Australian exports, in particular iron ore, the key component of steel. But China's recent economic slowdown is causing real problems for Australia because it's relied so much on commodities for its recent economic growth. Now, impressive GDP statistics may get economists excited, but how does that translate into living standards for average Australians? Well, firstly, real GDP growth has been partly boosted by rapid growth in the population. The Australian population has soared in recent decades, largely due to high net migration. Now, migration helps to delay the impact of an ageing population and boosts GDP. But if we look at real GDP per capita, it has been growing at a much slower rate, and this is important for determining living standards. If we look at real wage growth, the pandemic saw a significant decline in real wages, taking living standards all the way back to 2010. The government estimates real wages won't regain the pre-pandemic level until 2028. The crunch in living standards is quite a shock for an economy used to high living standards. It hasn't helped that inflation has been stubbornly high, requiring interest rates to be higher than the past decade. This has significantly increased the cost of mortgage payments. And this is a real problem in Australia because household debt is 183% of disposable income. This high level of debt reflects the rapid growth in house prices and the need for households to take out bigger mortgages. This has really distorted the economy and even caused social unrest. Whilst high housing costs is a global phenomenon, Australia is in a league of its own. In the worst affordable cities, prices are 13.8 times median income. Even in the most affordable cities, prices are still 6.8 times income, almost twice as expensive as the US. In 1990 in Australia, house prices were nine years of average earnings. Now they cost 16 and a half years. That's equivalent to an extra $167,000. Rents have been rising through the roof. Affordability is the worst it's ever been, with 10% of Australians spending more than 60% of their income on rent. It has led to a housing crisis with homelessness rates rising. And the biggest cause of rising homelessness is unaffordable rent. High GDP is not much use if the average person struggles to afford the basics of living. Why does such a rich country fail to prevent this kind of housing crisis? Well, firstly, the population has risen rapidly, an extra one million people in the past two years alone and house building rates have been nowhere near. Secondly, major cities, especially Sydney, have complex planning rules, which make it difficult for builders to build where demand is likely to be. Thirdly, the decade of ultra low interest rates made housing a profitable investment. And this was all supercharged by government policy, such as the 50% discount on capital gains introduced in 2000. As affordability started to worsen, the government offered grants for first-time buyers, but this only spurred demand on more, magnifying the problem. Rising prices, low tax and low interest rates 
made housing an excellent speculative investment, especially with supply not keeping up. But it's come at a huge cost to those who do not own. Now earlier we mentioned that Australia is in the top 10 of GDP per capita. But this is massaged by the value of the currency. If we take into account the cost of living and actual living standard using purchasing power parity, Australia falls to 22nd in that league table. The problem is that if you have a strong exporting commodity sector, it creates a relatively stronger exchange rate, which pushes up the relative cost of other exports. Behind Australia's commodity boom is a shrinking of a manufacturing sector. Manufacturing has been squeezed by services and primary products. It is a mini form of the resource curse or Dutch disease. Now at this point, it is worth mentioning it could have been a lot worse. Many countries with similar commodity wealth to Australia have struggled to contain corruption and had an even bigger loss of opportunity. Australia has a relatively good track record in transparency and rule of law, even if many of the commodity giants are foreign owned. But nevertheless, reliance on commodities for much of Australia's growth does have a number of problems. Firstly, concerns over global warming are seeing demand for commodities like coal start to fall. Australia hopes it will be able to boost new minerals like lithium and nickel for use in battery electric cars, but so far that has proved elusive. Demand for lithium has proved weaker than expected, and many mines have already scaled back their operations. Australian producers also claim China has been flooding the market with cheap minerals, wanting to dominate the global supply. Also, the reliance on fossil fuels highlights another potential problem, because Australia is vulnerable itself to global warming, with record temperatures threatening agriculture and quality of life. China is Australia's biggest export market. More than one quarter of all trade goes to China, but it is increasingly an uneasy relationship. Political disputes such as the origins of Covid have soured the relationship. And whilst China is very important to Australia, it doesn't work the other way around, with Chinese exports to Australia only a small fraction. Any trade war would hurt Australia a lot more than China. But at the moment it's not so much concerns about a trade war as more the crisis in the Chinese economy. The property bubble has burst and the huge demand for Australian iron ore is falling. The problem is that when an economy is based around mineral extraction, it can then become difficult to evolve and change. You can't just magically bring back a diversified manufacturing sector. Australia's economy definitely has a number of problems. Its large wealth has not satisfactorily been translated into higher real wages for ordinary households. The housing crisis is almost an existential threat. Yet it is important to bear in mind the economy still has certain strengths. It remains an attractive place to live. EIU rank Australian cities as amongst the most attractive in Southeast Asia. Australians do have good living standards, especially if you can afford your housing. Also, they tend to live longer than people in other Anglophone countries. There is free government healthcare, but many have private insurance too. Deaths by road accidents, respiratory diseases and firearm related deaths are noticeably much lower than the United States. The huge surge in migration has definitely exacerbated the housing crisis, but it also reflects how desirable it is to live in Australia. Australia also has the luxury of being picky about migration, meaning there is less concern about low-skilled migration, reducing wages for the unskilled. Australia also has lower geographical inequality than other countries like the UK and the United States. Though it is worth pointing out, the average life expectancy of an Aboriginal Australian is more than eight years lower than the national average. It's also interesting to compare the New Zealand and Australian economy. After the Second World War, GDP per capita stats were roughly equal, but Australia has grown at a faster rate than its neighbour across the sea. 
New Zealand is one of the few countries in the world perhaps to have a crazier housing market than Australia. And this is one factor behind the consistent net migration of Kiwis to Australia, around 25,000 a year. Another country with similarities to Australia is Ireland. Ireland has even higher real GDP per capita than Australia. But as this video shows, a lot of it is an illusion which hasn't done anything to improve living standards.